thank, thanks a lot, Phil. Um, I'm going to talk for about 20 minutes and then uh, make a kind of magical transformation into the host. But, but Laura and Phil and, and the team at Wise Sussex, um, and actually thanks hugely to them for inviting us along to speak and for putting together a great day. Um, and thanks to also the Digital Brighton people for organising a really excellent week of conferences uh, and events in my hometown so I can get up really late and, and, and get a bus into work, which is really great. So thanks for that. Yeah. Um, so I've worked, in, I've worked in broadcasting for about 10 years, from about uh, 2001 at the BBC through to when I left Channel 4 in 2011. Um, and it was during that period that we really saw uh, the change in audience behaviours that's now really defining the way the industry goes. Um, and so as part of that, I've been doing a lot of research and thinking about how those changing audience behaviours are changing the economic models and the creative models for telly. So, um, Laura and Phil asked me to kind of do a bit of a, um, a kind of opening keynote to try and set uh, a landscape that we're going to explore in a lot more detail with the rest of the speakers <coughs> today. So, today I'm going to talk about how we tell stories um, and how the way that audience behaviours are changing is changing the way we tell stories. Um, and I'm going to talk about the two forms of, of kind of connected storytelling that seem to be dominant now and then talk about how we can move on from them and start to explore new patterns. So, um, I left Channel 4 a couple of years ago and now run a company called Story Things. We uh, help a broad range of people from Faber and Faber to Google Creative Labs in New York to Diesel and World Wildlife Foundation and we kind of help them understand how you tell stories now and how to tell stories in a landscape of digital attention. Um, and when I started Story Things, I didn't really realise how controversial the word story and audiences were. Um, I knew from working in telly for ages that the word audiences was really loaded. Um, many of us talked about, uh, as, as we'll talk about later, the former audience, because TV thought of the audience purely in terms of numbers, purely in terms of these abstract measurements, and rarely as a kind of active participant in storytelling. Um, and then I left and started a company called Story Things, partly because I organised a conference called The Story. Um, and I didn't realise that in marketing and branding, story was another really, really loaded term. Um, it was this kind of mythical um, narrative beast that drives uh, people's interest <coughs> in your products and marketing. So I started trying to understand those terms in a lot more detail and, and, and really understanding how the way we've told uh, 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 stories and the way we've related to audiences has changed over the last few hundred years. Um, and I kind of realise now that we're going through a transition that's probably around 20, 30 years long and we're only about 10 years into it. That's actually really similar to the transition from uh, music hall and opera and, and, and theatre into the early years of broadcasting and cinema in the 20th century. And what happens when you're in that transition is, is when you're in the middle of it, patterns of storytelling that were dominant in the old kind of business models um, start to, to kind of decline and many diverse new patterns emerge. But in the middle, you often end up um, with something that's kind of suiting both business models. So you end up with patterns of storytelling that support the business models that are starting to become, you know, not, not redundant, but maybe less important than they were, um, but that also meets the needs of some of these new business models. So this, this kind of in-between phase is, is often dominated by these, by these kind of in-between patterns. Um, and right now, that pattern is, is the spike and the like. So, the spike is basically an artifact of the distribution era. Uh, in a world of distribution, everybody sees everything at exactly the same time. And so you see attention patterns which are incredibly synchronised um, and, and kind of similar to, to everybody. Um, and it's based around scheduling. Um, and scheduling actually um, was invented not by TV or broadcast, but by a group of entrepreneurs building a, a telephone-based service in the late 19th century called the Telephone Hamondo in Budapest. Um, and before that, the shape of stories was defined by other factors, you know, how long people could sit comfortably in a theatre or opera house, or how many pages you could afford to print in a book or a newspaper. But suddenly people could broadcast, and, and, and the telephone was used as a one-way broadcasting device by these entrepreneurs in the late 19th century. Um, and they had this problem, how do we organise stories when you can broadcast for 24 hours. You can actually kind of make it as long as you want. And so they decided to cut up uh, the day into hour-long chunks um, and to organize a schedule according to uh, those hour-long or part-hour-long chunks. Um, and 100 and whatever years later, we're still using that, that structure of the schedule. So this is the Telephone Hamondo. Um, you basically hired a one-way telephone that you had installed in your uh, house. 
Um, you couldn't speak into it, you couldn't listen to it, and you were sent the schedule of the uh, day's programs and you would pick up the phone and listen to it at various times. This is somebody uh, broadcasting some live music uh, to the early Tetham Hamondo. So this pattern of, of, of kind of simultaneous attention, uh, organised according to a schedule, is, is something that's actually being amplified by social media. Uh, people in TV, having spent a lot of uh, the 2000s being scared about the disruption of digital, are now realising that actually folding this conversation around simultaneous attention back into the programme is an incredibly powerful thing. Uh, when I was at Channel 4, we worked on Hughes Fish Fight, and, and this is from Second Sync. Um, if you don't know Second Sync, uh, I assume most of you here will, they're a really, really fantastic company doing brilliant work right now looking at how patterns of social conversation map onto different TV genres. Uh, so this is their map of the tweets around um, Hugh's uh, big fish fight, and you can see that spike, that kind of simultaneous pattern of attention. And so that spike has become the way in which most people think about digital storytelling, about using digital and social media to try and somehow amplify and, 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 and kind of grow that simultaneous nature of attention. Similar to that, the other kind of metric, the other kind of way of, of, of measuring the audience uh, that is dominant at the moment is, is the like. Uh, now, the like is not uh, just about Facebook. It's an artifact of, of earlier marketing analysis. Um, there's been kind of... Uh, uh, analysis of people's sentiment towards advertising from uh, devices like this back in the kind of 60s and 70s. Uh, USA Today have had their kind of Super Bowl ad TV ratings using a similar dial technique for quite a long while. Um, the worm was developed uh, and used in Australia in the 80s around political debates, this kind of idea that you're getting real-time uh, feedback about people's uh, um, res emotional responses to content. But this like is, is similar to the way that we've measured ratings, uh, uh, scheduled attention with ratings. The like is an abstraction of really complex emotions and ideas. It's one single measure. And in actual fact, if you look at the history of, 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 of the academic history of, of how we measure audiences, they call the period from around 1940 to 1950 to around now the era of one big number. Uh, and, and that's because in all of the content industries, pretty much everything um, all audiences were measured according to one big number in their sector. So that was Barb ratings or Nielsen ratings for TV. It was uh, um, ABCs for magazines and newspapers, uh, Rage R for radio. You know, all of these really complex audience behaviours were pretty much measured by one number. So we're kind of, the spike and the like are the kind of last artefacts of, of this era of one big number where we measure audience behaviour according to pretty simple abstract metrics. And of course, the like has kind of become meaningless through, through overuse. I'm not sure it's actually a really valuable way of explaining the complex sentiments behind um, the work that we do in our stories. So what I've been interested in the last few years is, is what will happen next. You know, as we start to understand um, audience behaviours a lot more and look at the storytelling potential, what happens after we get over the idea of the spike and the like? It's still a really, really dominant form. Most big advertising campaigns try and launch with a simultaneous pattern of attention. Most TV shows launch with a simultaneous pattern of attention. What happens when you start to explore other patterns of attention around storytelling? So I'm going to talk about a couple of, of behaviours and a couple of patterns that I've been tracking for a while. Um, but the, what's really interesting now is that audience behaviours have always been complex, but we can now track them. This is a, a graphic produced by um, uh, a, a guy from Twitter, and it's 30 seconds of Twitter mentions. So every single dot on the screen is an individual tweet, and the stars and the kind of lines zooming out for it are showing the complex pattern of retweets and conversation happening around um, each tweet. And we're now seeing new patterns and new ways of measuring them. This is a um, uh, uh, an excerpt from the film They Will Be Blood uh, using eye tracking, so showing what the audience is actually spending their attention on as the camera pans and people move in and out. And so we're starting to get these really, really granular measures of, of how people are spending their attention and what it is that they're actually doing and what they're looking at. So I want to talk about some new patterns and some new ways of measuring the way we tell stories. The first one is probably the pattern which most businesses, particularly TV, are, are becoming increasingly familiar with, and it's the binge. Uh, we started noticing this around Channel 4 uh, in about 2006, 2007, around shows like uh, Skins, which were predominantly watched by younger audiences. Um, and even as early as 2007, 2008, around 60 to 70% of the viewing of Skins in total was outside of the schedule. It was people watching on Catch Up, people watching on DVD. Um, but basically, the binge is a pattern uh, particularly suited to very immersive storytelling, like drama, um, and to a lesser extent, documentary. 
Um, and the binge pattern is all about people saving their attention to really immerse themselves in these rich story worlds. Um, and we're seeing this with things like House of Cards, Netflix, uh, the first show they commissioned where they just put all 13 hours up at the same time. They weren't looking for that spike. They don't care if you watch House of Cards one episode a day for 13 days or one every hour for a 13 hour binge or whether you watch it once a year for 13 years. As long as you pay them you know, five pound a month, they don't really care how you watch it. They don't care about that pattern of attention. In actual fact, Ted Sarandos, the uh, uh, chief content officer, of Netflix has said they're not interested in ratings. They're not publishing the ratings for their shows because it's just not interesting to them. And he says that TV needs to get over this reliance on ratings as a measure of attention. They've got way more valuable data by looking at the complex patterns of audiences watching their shows. So this is really making the commissioning of drama something which is increasingly only viable uh, or, or only viable at the very top end to businesses that have a direct sales or subscription relationship with the audience. So play, people like HBO, people like Sky, uh, people like Netflix that have a direct transactional relationship and are less reliant on display advertising. If you're a, a, a content distributor that's reliant on placing ads in the middle of a schedule to make your money, then the fact that 60 to 70% of your audience are going to watch outside the schedule and fast forward the ads is a terrible economic situation to be in. So this binging pattern <coughs> is starting to change the economics of the production of, of things like drama. The second pattern that's really interesting is, is the pledge. And this is something which is emerging particularly strongly in film uh, and the gaming industry and to a lesser extent books. Um, and it's fascinating not just as an economic intervention, uh, innovation, but also actually a um, new way of building and relating to an audience. So this is uh, Zach Braff who uh, r slightly controversially uh, raised money for his sequel to Garden State on Kickstarter. Um, and People are seeing Kickstarter as a way of basically uh, disintermediating commissioners and broadcasting and, and, and building a direct relationship uh, to your audience. But I think it's actually more interested in, interesting than that. Because not only is the pledge, the idea that you kind of go out and get money to make a product um, interesting economically, but it actually completely changes the way you tell stories. Um, and this is something that a lot of people are just beginning. Because what you do when you get you know, thousands or tens of thousands of people to pony up and pay for something that hasn't been made yet, is they're not just buying a product, they're buying a relationship to you as a storyteller. They want perks, they want rewards, they might want a walk-on part, they might want their name in the credits. They feel like they're part of the project. And managing that expectation as part of the storytelling process is something that we're only just beginning to see models for. Um, quite a few Kickstarter campaigns have struggled afterwards because of the sheer kind of cognitive load of dealing with um, a bunch of customers whilst you're actually trying to build the product at the same time. And I think there's huge storytelling potential in thinking how do you actually tell the story of the production of the work as well as the final work itself. And so this idea of the, pl of, of, of the pledge as a new, not just economic model, but a new storytelling arc around projects is something which I think is only going to become more and more important in the next few years. Um, the next pattern is, is really, really, uh, I think Channel 4 are doing fantastic work in this in um, um, specialist factual, so kind of science and natural history and, and history programming. Um, but we're seeing it elsewhere as well. And, and it's what I call the long live event, which isn't a really catchy title. Um, but there's something very fascinating going on in the way people are telling storytelling around events that happen over long periods of time. So uh, Big Brother was probably the first one of this, where you had a very, very long event happening 24-7. And then TV shows were almost like news reports on what were happening. Um, but Channel 4 are doing some fascinating experiments, and Kate Courton and the team at Channel 4 are doing this really, really well. Uh, this is a show called Easter Eggs Live. Um, and basically, it was a month-long online experience where there were webcams and content where they were tracking a number of eggs as they were hatching around Easter of different animals. And that was punctuated with uh, TV shows and a final kind of weekend of TV shows. Um, and this has really happened because it is now technically and economically trivial to essentially just put constant streams of content on air. Um, so you can just leave cameras watching things for a very long time. But there's a fascinating um, kind of rhythm and tension in the storytelling with long live events. Typically you have an ongoing event which can have random actions in it. Things can happen in ways that you don't necessarily predict. And that causes flocking. That causes people who are fans of the project to talk on social media and say, oh my god, look at this, it's eggs hatching. Or a friend of mine, uh, uh, actually a Brightonian, Simon Thornton, uh, basically seemed to take the whole of the Olympics off last year and just sat at home and tweeted about it. And I used him as a kind of an ambient uh, indicator of, of whether something interesting was about to 
happen if I was at work. And so he might be tweeting saying, we're about to win a gold. And then I would quickly get and you know, bring up uh, BBC on the uh, desktop or, or switch on the TV um, and try and watch the gold medal as it was happening. So I'm interested in these long live events where you set up a kind of way of tracking something that happens for a long period of time. And you rely on social media for this flocking behavior, for people to kind of say to their friends, quick, switch on, something's happening. Um, and then the actual t broadcast TV program becomes a kind of news report on what's been happening on these things for a while. So I think this is fascinating um, and a really, really interesting uh, uh, a kind of new pattern around factual TV. Not sure how it would work with, with, with fictional formats at all, but a really fascinating one about factual. And then finally, the one that is, is, is probably the most emerging at the moment, um, and that is, that is my fuel band there, um, is the report. And, and I'm not sure what this means for TV, but I think there's, a, there's potentially a really, really interesting opportunity here. Um, but people are starting to get used to devices that basically tell a story about yourself through data, uh, whether it's a fuel band, um, whether it's Strava, the kind of current really cult app that measures all of your, your, your behavior. Um, whether it's just your Facebook timeline, um, you know, we're starting to leave these data trails online, these kinds of histories of ourselves through the devices and the services um, that, are, that, that, that are recording our lives. Um, and how you tell those stories back to people is something that I think we're only just beginning to understand. You know, timeline was a really radical invention for Facebook to try, to try and start to tell the story of your life and start to tell the history um, of what you do. We, d we did a project for... Um, Faber and Faber with uh, John Lanchester around his book Capital a couple of years ago and we told the story of the next 10 years of your life and, and the, the weirdest thing was he wrote an entry for uh, 2017 and he said you know at this point most people would have been on Facebook for a decade and that really made me stop and think wow what would it actually mean to have like a decade of your life built into a service like Facebook obviously Facebook might have died by then and we might be on something else but you know we're starting to leave these really interesting uh, data trails and how can you tell those stories and how can you fold that into other projects is something which I think we're just going to start seeing uh, a lot more. You see it already in sport, you know, the kind of datification of sport um, and the way that we, we tell the story of what's happened in a game with kind of analysis of passing and miles run and positioning and stuff like that is really interesting. I think you're going to start seeing that kind of level of data analysis in other formats. You know, I can definitely see it happening in Specialist Factual. I also think reality shows are probably going to start exploring this stuff as well. There's this increasing movement around the quantified self, these devices that uh, and services that measure us. And, and I think that's an incredibly powerful way, rather chilling as well in certain ways, but an incredibly powerful way to start telling stories. So, I think there's four questions uh, uh, about how we start to tell stories in patterns that aren't just about the spikes and the likes, that aren't just about traditional scheduled TV and likes as abstractions of, of, of our audience's behavior. I'm really interested in how binging is gonna change TV formats. Um, uh, the makers of House of Cards for Netflix said that they approached the storytelling in a very different way because they didn't feel the need to create cliffhangers at the end of episodes in the same way you would if there was a weak gap between episodes. They, they kind of assumed that audiences would be watching in series and so they kind of let stories flow through a lot more. They approached it as a 13-hour movie, they said, rather than as a 13-part series. Um, when Netflix commissioned Arrested Development, the uh, creative team there, actually tried to push it further and they, they wanted to tell the story through seeing the same event from 15 different perspectives and originally they said um, we'd actually quite like it if you could watch it in any order you know it doesn't matter and later they said well actually we set up some gags uh, in early shows that you won't really get unless you do watch it in order but I love that idea that actually you could create a story that you could essentially watch the episodes in any order. I'm interested in how pledging will change our attitude to, to risk and relationship you know it is the idea that you can go to an audience and say, do you want to fund this prior to making a commissioning decision is already very, very, very uh, uh, disruptive. But the idea that actually it's going to change the way that we tell stories because of this need to bring the audience with us through the production is something that we're only just beginning to explore. I'm really interested in how long events change this relationship between online and broadcast. Um, as I said, long events are not really about social media supporting a broadcast. It's about online supporting a very, very long kind of ambient pattern of attention and then being able to support these, these, these kind of flocking spikes, these kind of random spikes when events happen in ways that are not necessarily predictable. And then TV almost being the kind of news format that reports on those behaviours. And I'm really interested in how reports help audiences tell their stories. Um, we did a few things at Channel 4, like Million Pound Drop, where we kind of started to fold 
what people were doing at home back into what went on in the studio. Uh, um, you know, Davina was an astonishingly adept reporter and David Flynn, who developed that format at Endemol, was absolutely adamant that the production team for Monterosa, the, the, who made the game for Million Pound Drop, would actually be in the gallery during the live broadcast so that they could throw data from the game into the story. Um, and there was actually a brilliant moment when we realised um, uh, that audiences were cheating. Uh, one of the questions in the first series was, because it was a live show, we could ask questions that were based on, on live events. And um, one of the questions was, which of these four women are currently, uh, is currently favourite to win um, Celebrity Mum of the Year on PaddyPower.com? And so many people at home cheated that we crashed PaddyPower.com, their site went down. Um, and we managed to throw that, you know, we, we got that data back to the gallery and Davina kind of at the end of the question turned to the audience and said, you know, by the way, you're being naughty, we know you're cheating, you've kind of crashed this site. And everyone just went, ah, that's great. So, you know, I'm kind of interested about how we can throw live data from the audience back into formats um, and help that change the way we tell stories. So, that's it. Thank you very much for that. That's kind of setting a bit of the landscape. I know we've got a great set of speakers um, for the rest of today who will be talking about projects that explore some of these ideas and some of these themes and, and give you really practical ideas of how that might work. Um, I'm going to introduce Rob in a minute, but we've got a, about five minutes if anyone's got any specific questions or would like to ask anything um, from this talk. Yes, uh, can you wait for the mic actually because we are recording it, so it would be great to make sure everyone that watches the YouTube can hear you. Uh, it's a slightly left field question. Obviously, you're talking specifically about TV formats, but do you see any kind of interesting trends in terms of stories and the way that like uh, uh, films are being made? You know, we're talking sort of you know the larger studios, that kind of thing. Um, I think at the very top end, um, less so, just because the uh, economics of cinema and the distribution of cinema as kind of you know two-hour-long films or whatever hasn't really changed. I think it's interesting that films are getting longer and longer. I think The Hobbit has about three hours. I think what, you know, what happens is when audience patterns change, each medium has to kind of work out what it does best. So when TV, when radio got kicked out of the living room, um, it had to work out what it did that was better than TV. So you know, radio kind of dominated a whole range of forms <coughs> of storytelling, from drama to news to opera to you know, music to factual documentaries and everything, because it was in the living room. And then TV came along and kicked it out, and radio had to work out what does it do that's best. And it turns out that it's actually really good at kind of being in the background and being ambient and being in particular contexts that TV couldn't be, like the car and the workplace. And so you started getting formats like Drive Time that were based around the fact that you could do other things while you were listening to radio. Um, and I think, you know, kind of cinema is realising that it is obviously spectacle. That's where 3D is coming from. That's where all these kind of IMAX, you know, it, is, it has to kind of push further towards its affordances because some of the kinds of storytelling that it does can happen just as well on DVD or on, on demand and stuff like that. So I think what you'll see is that, you know, increasingly spectacular TV. I think documentaries are really interesting. I wrote a blog post this week looking at the kind of how we tell long-form factual stories is getting really interesting because at one stage you've got newspapers really struggling to come up with business models to support their long-form journalism and at the other stage you've got documentaries really struggling to find an audience for their long-form films and I wonder if somehow the, the, the formats are not quite right yet for the new patterns of attention. So for example uh, documentaries were the second, in, in terms of number, the second biggest genre in film release um, in the UK last year but represented only 1.4% of the total turnover. So, you know, there are loads of documentary films being made, but very few of them, people just don't want to watch them in cinemas. It's just not the way that people want to consume documentary. They tend to like watching it at home or on, on TV or on on demand or stuff like that. So I think that, that those forms are going to start to have to work out what is the right pattern of attention for long-form factual? You know, how do you want to consume uh, a detailed, rich story about a kind of factual subject? Is it something that you want to read? Is it like, you know, Snowfall or The Guardian's kind of Firestorm, one of these kinds of HTML5 navigable thing with pops of video and stuff like that. I actually, uh, I was on the jury for the Innovation Award at Sheffield Documentary Festival earlier on this year, and The Guardian entered it. Now, you know, Documentary Film Fest is pr predominantly about film. So the fact that The Guardian entered a project and actually made the shortlist is really interesting. You know, they're not really filmmakers. And what they submitted was Firestorm, one of these snowfall-like interactive HTML5 formats. So I think that there are some genres that are going to become that are going to have to find the new attention patterns that audiences want to kind of use around those genres. We know what it is for drama, we know what it is for news. News is increasingly a stream, and, and, and ITV, uh, made by many, redesigned ITV News' website uh, uh, earlier on this year, and it's now effectively just a stream of content 
um, you know, kind of tweets and pictures and videos, which they then aggregate into stories. The old idea of having an editorial structure that kind of has news and sport and stuff like that has been pushed out the window because they realise that we consume news by gathering fragments for our streams and then going on later on to kind of read them and compile them as stories. So I think these genres are starting to find what the right formats are. Um, and it's not all about TV, you know, an awful lot of those patterns of attention are going to be about mobile behaviours or they're going to be about uh, kind of on-demand behaviours or stuff like that. But I think it's going to be a lot more about genre uh, than it is around platform. Uh, the kind of real job of, of, of coming up with new formats are going to be finding, you know, what are the right formats for particular genres like specialist factual, documentary, uh, news, drama, stuff like that. Does that kind of answer your question? Ish, ish. Okay, any more before we move on to Rob? Yep, one more down here. Again, can you wait for that mic? I really enjoyed the talk, so thanks very much for those ideas that, uh, that you exchanged there. Uh, just in, in uh, obviously, we're talking about the explosion of stories and even more stories. Uh, if, uh, in t how, how do you actually, do you have any ideas on how you actually attract attention to a story in the first place? So you've talked about the structures and how you engage sure. audiences presumably once you get them, but in a world of competing stories, let's say about uh, uh, the uh, Easter egg. If there's five of them, five of the sort of kind of nest building things, how yeah. would you go about uh, attracting attention to your particular so, story? So the really big shift is, you know, we, we are in this kind of 30 year transition. Um, and it's not, you know, TV is not going to go away, but, but the, the, the kind of, the, sh the ratio of how we find content is shifting. So we're moving from a world of distribution where, you know, 20, 30 years ago, the stories that we would consume would be, we would find them because somebody had decided to distribute them to us. So they would be commissioned for TV, they would be published by a publisher, they would be printed in a newspaper, whatever. And we're now in a world of circulation where an increasing quantity of the stories we find, we find through other people sharing them with us. Um, and that's a really fundamental shift in how we find stories and how culture operates. And it has a lot of, um, a lot of new qualities to it that are very different from a world of distribution. It's very spiky. Um, but the key thing is, is that people share stories because when we share stories, there's a great book by uh, an American academic called um, uh, Henry Jenkins called Spreadable Media. And, and he deliberately used the word spreadable because he wanted to kill the word viral. You know, for, for the last 10 years, we've talked about stories in a world of circulation as viral objects. And he says that's the wrong metaphor because viruses spread without any decision being made by the host. When you get a cold, you don't decide to have a cold. You don't decide who you sneeze on. The virus just uses you as a dumb host. In actual fact, when we spread content, we do it for very specific and personal reasons. If I share something with a friend, I'm doing it with an intent. And I'm saying something about a social relationship when I share content. And it's understanding what those drivers are. You know, why would somebody decide to circulate your piece of content? Is it because it's shocking, because it's funny, because it relates to something. I'm a Spurs fan, so I've been, I actually had somebody email me recently saying, can you stop talking about Gareth Bale on your Twitter stream? It's getting really boring. Um, but you know, I kind of say that because they're the things I in, I'm interested in and other people are kind of, that follow me, I know are Spurs fans as well. So, you know, we share something because it's just something about ourselves. You know, we don't share something because we love the brand or because we're kind of dumb hosts. We, we, we share knowingly because of that relationship. So part of the attention problem is understanding how does your story operate in a world of circulation rather than distribution? What are the drivers for people wanting to share? Um, and, and why would people really decide to, to, to kind of do that? The second part, and, I, and again, I think this is something we've barely begun to explore, is, you know, we are all saturated with, with content and stories. You know, there are more stories than we could possibly ever want to decide uh, to, to consume. And I think we're missing a kind of an etiquette of storytelling. Um, if you, most traditional media forms over time, build a set of expectations around them which really helps the audience make decisions. So you know if you're going to go to the cinema that it's going to be a couple of hours long, you're going to sit in a dark room, you need to be there at 8.30. You know if you switch the TV on, programs are probably going to be about an hour long. You know, these, these kinds of things have an etiquette around them which is a, an understanding between the storyteller and the audience about how much of your attention we're asking for. At the moment we're really bad at doing that on digital. You know, I love kind of big interactive story projects but I kind of click on them and after about five minutes I'm often like, uh, how long is this going to take? And I start getting a bit nervous and it's like, is this going to be an hour or, or 10 minutes or whatever? And what we've started doing in our projects is, is being very explicit to people about how much of their attention we want. You know, that this is an experience that will be an email a day for 10 days or we, we, we do a weekly newsletter 
Um, and at the beginning, we just have the links and we say how long each thing is. You know, is it a 45 minute watch or a five minute read? And we get more feedback about that one little feature than virtually anything else on the newsletter. People love the fact that we're telling them how much of their attention we want. And I think we're going to have to be a lot more overt now in saying to people, this is how long this is going to take. Because the, the kind of usual cues for understanding how long something takes, the thickness of a book or, you know, a TV schedule or stuff like that, just aren't there in digital. We're going to have to try and learn how to put those signifiers and those signposts in. Because because most of the time when you see a new story as an audience, a member of the audience, your first question consciously or subconsciously is, have I got time for this? You know, I can normally only series link about two or three big uh, drama shows at any one time because I just know I've not got the time to catch up with the others. I've just delayed Top of the Lake, which I'm sure was brilliant, but I know I'm just never going to get around to watching it. So helping audiences manage their attention is one of the biggest problems we can solve with, with storytelling. Okay, that brings us up to the quarter hour. So thank you very much for that.